Welcome friends, in this video we are going to look at the science paper 1 for the year 2023 and uh, this paper was written by the external candidates. Our focus is on question uh, section C where you are given three questions and asked to choose two questions of your choice. So let's begin with the first question. Uh, figure C 1.1 shows a velocity time graph of a car of mass 1200 kilograms. Uh, velocity time graph has velocity in the y-axis as we can see and time in the x-axis. Now if, uh, we can see the first question is it? calculate the acceleration of the car in the first two seconds. Now what is acceleration? Acceleration is defined as the rate of change of velocity. So whenever the velocity, the velocity is changing, we are going to have the acceleration. Or it tells us how fast or slow the, the velocity is changing. So that is what the acceleration is all about. Now, uh, if you look at the first question, we are taught to find the acceleration in the first two seconds. So the first two seconds is at this point. So the origin is here. Here we are going to have the initial velocity because this is where the car was starting. Then the final velocity for this one will be this one as our final velocity. Now if we look at the units for acceleration, acceleration is given by meters per second squared. Okay, so let's look at how can we derive the units for acceleration. Okay, acceleration is equal to find velocity minus, so we'll just say velocity divided by time. So the average between uh, velocity and time will give you acceleration. Now, let us write V, then in this line we can write it as, uh, write it as time. From there, Let's look at the units for velocity. We know that velocity is given in meters per second. Then here we are going to say divided by then this t. The units for time is seconds. So how do you do for a question like this one? So it's meters per second. Then this one, uh, s is over one. So the division can change into multiplication then we are going to flip the fraction. So this will be 1 over S. So M times 1 is just M over S times S is S squared. So I just wanted to show you how the meters per second squared comes from. So to summarize, we are saying acceleration tells us how the speed is increasing or decreasing over time. Okay, so after we have at least some ideas where these uh, measurements comes from, we can now look at uh, the given question. Acceleration is given by final velocity minus initial over t. Final velocity is where the time or the point is ending. So here we can see that the velocity is increasing but the acceleration is constant because the line is straight. So the, the final velocity is 30 minus the initial where it started from 0 over time we are given 2 seconds. 30 minus 0 is 30 over 2 which is acceleration is equal to 15 meters per second squared. This simply means that for every second, the speed of 15 meters was increasing. So that's what we can summarize. So we can say for one second, the velocity of 15 meters per second must be achieved. So that is what the acceleration is all about. It's all about the changing of uh, velocity with time. B, explain why the acceleration is zero between two seconds to four seconds. So let's go where there is two seconds here. So if we move up, 
the velocity for two seconds is 30. Then the velocity for four seconds is also 30. So the reason why the acceleration between two seconds and four seconds is zero because the velocity is constant. So whenever the velocity is constant, the acceleration is zero. Acceleration exists only when the velocity is changing. So we can answer our question here because the velocity was constant. It was not changing. And um, you can try by proving uh, whenever the, uh, the velocity is not changing, the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity, which is if we subtract 30 minus 30, we still get 0. So that's a concept here. That's the reason why at this point, the acceleration is always 0. The final is equal to initial. Now we move on to question C. Question C, calculate the displacement of the car while its velocity was increasing. So displacement is same as the, the distance. How can we find the distance when the velocity was increasing? The distance that we are solving for must be at this point since it's where the velocity is increasing. So we can see that we have the triangle shape displacement which is same as distance is equal to half times z bh now b is the base from 0 to 2 is our b the height is this distance from the x-axis up to the final velocity is our height so displacement is equal to half times the base is 2 times the height is given by 30 which is x is equal to if we cancel this the displacement in the first uh, I mean while the velocity was increasing is 30 meters we move on to question e. so this was question C so let's move on to Question D, calculate the resultant force on this car during its acceleration. We have the acceleration. Now our work is to find the, the resultant force. So what we have that can help us to find the resultant force, we have mass here. And the acceleration, we've calculated this one. So we can use the formula from the Newton's second law of motion which is force is equal to mass multiplied by the acceleration so what's our mass our mass is 1200 kilograms our acceleration in the first two seconds we calculated to be 15 1200 multiplied by 15 I'm getting 18 thousand newtons this means that for for us to move the car of mass 1200 kilograms for it to accelerate at 15 meters per second squared the force of 18,000 must be applied remember for an object to move there should be a force so the force uh, that should make an object to accelerate depends on the mass uh, the mass so the amount of force that you should do apply to a certain object depends on the mass for you to achieve whatever acceleration that you want to achieve so 18,000 newtons is the force that is needed to push this car to achieve the acceleration of 15 meters uh, per second so for every uh, one second a 15 meters must be achieved i mean a 15 meters per second must be achieved for every second 15 meters must be achieved so like if we go back to this one here so this is where our face so you can see that here there should be 15 so for every one second a 15 meters is achieved 
for this one another 15 is achieved if we are to continue for three seconds we can achieve another 15 here we should get at least 45 so that's what the whole thing is about we move on to question e distinguish between speed and velocity so the difference that we can give here is we can say speed is a scalar quantity whereas velocity is a vector quantity okay so here is simple maybe what can help you to remember this look at the speed the word speed starts with the letter s scalar also s so this is the thing that you can use to remember then for velocity it's v and for vector quantity it's also v now to explain what is uh, really happening here is that whenever you are given a speed speed you only give the magnitude you don't have to to show the direction is if for example if someone says um, I am let's say I'm in a car moving at 80 kilometers per hour so that is it uh, a scalar quantity why you don't know the direction where that person is going to but if someone says I am driving at 80 kilometers per hour heading east whenever you are given a direction therefore it becomes a vector quantity so that was the concept here for F calculate the displacement of the car for the whole journey displacement of the car for the whole journey this is similar as the total distance for the whole journey it can be calculated by finding each segment we can calculate each segment or we can find the total uh, distance at once so let's do this let's find the one that i have shaded here so we have uh, a trapezium so this is a trapezium so if this is a trapezium the distance on top will be considered a now since we have the distance in the first two seconds let's just find the distance beginning at 2 ending at 8 so the distance from 2 up to 8 is b then the height still the same so the height is this one so we're going to say displacement is equal to half a plus b times height half a is the number from here so what do you do you need to go in the x-axis that is why you're supposed to get the numbers so the difference between 2 and 4 is just 2 4 minus 2 is 2 plus the base the base is beginning from 2 up to 8 so the difference between 8 and 2 is 6 so you, you just have to subtract 8 minus 2 will give you a 6 then the height is still 30 2 plus 6 is 8 half of 80 will give us 4 times 30 30 times 4 will give us 120 meters so the distance from 2 seconds up to 80 seconds is 120 so the total distance or displacement is 120 plus 30 which is 150 150 meters is our total displacement now what if we want to find the same answer at once we can find the same answer without breaking our figure in segments we are going to use the same uh, formula for a trapezium distance is equal to half a plus b times height the only difference this time is that the base will start from 0 up to 8 we are not going to do any subtraction so our b 
is this one since we want to find the whole total distance at once but t for a a remains the same the height remains the same so let's do our math half a is still 2 plus c b since we are starting from 0 up to 8 b is 8 then the height is 30 okay 2 plus c 2 plus c uh, 8 is 10, half of 10 is 5 times 30. If we multiply 5 times 30, we get 150 meters. This is how we can uh, find the total displacement given a question like this. So I'm sure I have given you some ideas about this question. Let's move on to the second question. So the second question requires us we need to make a graph. Now since I don't have the actual graph, I, I will see what I can do to just give you some ideas on how to go about this one. Uh, table C 2.1 shows uh, data collected from an experiment to determine the resistance of a conductor. The above we have voltage 0, 4, 10, 16, 26, 42 up to 80. Current 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Uh, a, plot a graph of voltage against current. Here, the first one before against C represents the y-axis. After against represents the x-axis. This is our x-axis. This is our y-axis. So let's see the space that we have if we can make a graph here. So let's draw our x or y plane. Now under science, you need to come up with your own scale. The scale that you think will fit the given number. So in the y-axis, the lowest number is uh, 0. Then the highest number is 80. So we can just say 2 centimeters to represent 10 units. 0. Here we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Yeah. So the scale that we are using in y-axis is 2 centimeters represent uh, 10 units. Then for x-axis, uh, we can see that we have the pattern here. For this one, no? we just say 2 centimeters represent 2 units. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. In the x axis, we have uh, current. In y axis, it's voltage. So let's begin. The first coordinate is 0, 0, which is just here at the origin. The second one, uh, 2, 4. So if you are using the actual graph paper, you just have to count 4 small boxes going up in terms of the y-axis so uh, 2 comma 4 will be somewhere here the second one uh, 4 comma 10 4 comma 10 somewhere here third one uh, 6 comma 16 6 comma 16 somewhere here 8 comma 26 8 comma 26 somewhere here 10 comma 42 so 10 comma 40 here you add two more 42 somewhere here 12 comma 80 somewhere here so we can see that even if i'm not using the actual graph paper 
the type of the cave that we are dealing with is not a straight line and remember there is an interpretation for a cave like this one so that is the idea that i wanted you to know so what i can just share for you for a question like this one under uh, science you need to learn how to make your own uh, scale it's different from mathematics because in mathematics you are given a scale given a scale of shanshan to present this so in mathematics you are given a scale but for science you need to come up with your own scale as long as the numbers that you have in both axes are able to fit on, on your graph paper then you are good to go and make sure that the pattern remains the same if you are two centimeters represent 10 in the y-axis make sure that at each square a 10 is added for the previous number we move on to question b use the graph to estimate the resistance when the current is 5 amps how can we find the resistance so resistance is given by voltage divided by current we have the current we are going to use the graph to find the voltage then from there we can find the actual answer the current is 5 amps so 5 amps is somewhere here you go in the x-axis since that's where the current is you draw a dotted line parallel to the y-axis upon reaching the curve you turn 90 degrees moving parallel to the uh, x-axis the point at which where you are going to touch the y-axis represents the voltage so i can approximately say this is somewhere like 15 so my voltage is 15 resistance is equal to voltage is 15 over the current is uh, 5 amps 15 divided by 5 we get 3 ohms we move on to C Roman number 1 does the conductor obey ohms law so whenever you are given or maybe after you are done plotting your graph and you have a curve that is not a straight line if it's not linear then the conclusion is that whatever conductor that you are looking at does not it didn't obey the ohm's law for it to obey the ohm's law you need to have a straight line why do we need a straight line so that we are able to satisfy the ohm's law uh, which states that current must be directly proportional to voltage so whenever you have a direct relationship you need to have a straight line now in our case even if i'm not using the actual graph paper i can still tell that it's not a straight line so we say no it did not obey ohms law just find your answer we can give by a curve we can say because the curve was not linear now what does it mean if we say the curve was not linear what is happening to resistor so what is happening to resistor is that the resistor is now changing the resistor at this point let's say this is point a point b and uh, we can just make it three points is enough if you want you can check you can find the resistor at a resistor at a can be found by uh, 10 divided by 2 we have 5 ohms here then here it will give us maybe 3 point something then here we may have uh, something like here. it's it's a bigger number here so we can see that the resistance is changing so whenever the resistance is changing then the conductor is not obeying ohms law for it to obey the ohms law we need to have a constant resistance since the current must be 
direct proportion to room voltage. Now, let's see if we can also add some more information. Uh, let's look at uh, an ordinary bulb. We know the, the tungsten, the filament that is found in the ordinary bulbs. Before you switch on the bulb, the filament is, is, is cold. Now, after you switch on, the resistance of the filament at that particular time will be different to after sometimes after the bulb is now hot. Because as the filament, uh, the temperature of the filament is changing, uh, probably is increasing. The resistance is also changing. So that is an example of a conductor that behaves or that cannot obey the Ohm's law. So Ohm's law cannot be obeyed if the conductor uh, is the, the temperature. One of the factors is if the temperature of the conductor is changing after you switch on that uh, electrical appliance. As long as it's changing, then the resistance will also change. And we now can uh, conclude by saying it is not obeying Ohm's law. We move on to question D. What term is used to describe such type of conductor? Which conductor are we looking at? The ones that does not obey Ohm's law. These are known as non-ohmic conductor. Give an example of a conductor that behaves like this. So we say D, tungsten. In the ordinary bulbs. Then for those that obey Ohm's law, they are known as ohmic. So if we remove the uh, prefix nan, we have uh, the one that obeys. If we add nan, then we have uh, the one that does not uh, obey the Ohm's law. So let's go to question three. Under question three, it's also the question that is requiring a graph paper. So in science, you need to be good when it comes to graph paper because whether you like it or yes, there will be at least one question that you are going to use a graph paper. Or maybe two, depends on in which question that you are going to think are simple for you. Question C. Uh, figure C 3.1 shows an apparatus used by grade 12 learner to detect radioactive emissions. Background radiation was among the emissions detected. So let's not worry about the diagram, though it's just giving us uh, the picture, radioactive source. This is where they are produced, the radiations, they mean stated by this, they are able to be shown by the counter. The first question is, question A, Roman number one. State what is meant by background radiation. So what are these background radiations? On Earth, uh, in the atmosphere or in air, there is a small amount of radiation that is just present. It's always there. Uh, it's always there. So that small amount of radiation present on Earth at all times is what we call background radiation. This is a small amount of radiation a small amount of radiation present on earth on earth at all times Roman number two give one example of a background radiation we can use radon gas, even a cosmic rays. We move on to question B. Uh, table B 3.2 shows the result obtained from the experiment after taking account of background radiation. Okay. Plot a graph of count rate, count per minute against time. Count rate is Y. Remember, before the word against is Y, after against is time. So this is our x-axis, 
y-axis we can begin by we make the xy plane even please as you are studying uh, make sure you use the actual graph paper so that you get something that is making sense in the y-axis we have numbers from 0 up to 200 so what scale can we use you can use the I'm sure on the actual graph paper you can use two centimeters to represent 20 units I'm sure it can fit now since me I'm just trying to use this uh, space here I will just use it two centimeters to represent uh, 50 50 100 remember the concept is the same 150 200 here count per minute in the x-axis 0 30 60 we'll say 2 centimeters represent 30 units 30 60 90 120 time in minutes the first one 200 comma 0 is here the second one 30 comma 100 so you can see that here we are dealing with the a radioactive decay because we can see that the half of 200 is 100, half of 100 is 50, half of 50 is 25, half of 25 is 12.5. It is the half life that we are dealing with here. 30, 100. 30, 100 is somewhere here. 60, 50. 60, 50. 90,25 So you are going to have a graph like this Something like this We are done with the first question Roman number 2 from the graph Determine the half-life So how do we find the half-life given Or after we are done plotting the graph Half-life is equal to half times the original half times the original is this number the number of whatever before any decay which was 200 so half of 200 is giving us 100 after you find the 100 you need to go in the y-axis where there is 100 draw a dotted a line parallel to the x-axis the same way you do in statistics after touching the curve then make a 90 10 draw also a dotted line parallel to the y-axis so the point at which you are touching the x-axis represents the half-life this means that every after 30 minutes Half of the substance must decay by half. I mean, not half, but the substance must decay by half. And it's making sense if we go back to this. Uh, here, it's before any decay. After 30 minutes, half decayed, we have uh, 100. After another 30 minutes, half of 100 decayed, 50 remained. After another 30 minutes, half decayed, 25. After another 30 minutes, half decayed. We get, we get now 12.5. Roman number 2. What fraction will have decayed? We have decayed at 120. This 12.5, it is what is remaining after uh, 120 minutes. So to know the amount that decayed, we are going to get 200 subtract 
So 200 minus 12.5. I'm getting 187.5. 187.5 is the amount that decayed. 12.5, remember, is what remained after 120 minutes. So to make it a fraction, we'll say 187.5 over the total is 200. This is our final answer for Roman number uh, 3. For the last one, a nucleus of uranium given the mass number 235 here, the atomic number 92 emits one alpha particle to form thorium. We are given the daughter atom. So what do you do whenever you are, you are asked to write an equation for the decay that involves emission of one alpha particle? The mass number, you subtract four units. 235 minus four is 231. 92 minus two, you get 90 plus this. So this is the answer for question C. So this is what I can share for this section. Yes, so I have at least contributed to your studies. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.